Hello, everyone, and welcome back for a brand new episode of Collider Connected. This is going to be a fun one because look at who we have here today. It is Dan Stevens here promoting Eurovision Song Contest, the Story of Fire Saga, and also the rental. Congratulations on both films, Eurovision in particular. I had so much fun watching that movie. Thank you. Yes, it's a long title. Quite a long movie, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a fair point. A title to match the movie. I finally have been able to say the title, though. It's taken a, a couple times to practice that, though. Yeah. I think it's affectionately called Eurovision. But yeah, there we go. Your, oh Eurovision God. movie is the hashtag. That, that's helped me yeah. out quite a bit. Yeah. Um, we always like to start at the very beginning here. And uh, the first thing I want to know is, what movies and shows were you watching when you were younger? And do you find that those things have shaped your taste in the roles you pick today? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I think, yes, probably. I, I grew up watching a lot of, um, quite a lot of like classic cinema, really. I mean, classic for, for my generation. So a lot of um, like Jimmy Stewart movies and a lot of Peter Sellers movies. And I feel like, somewhere between those you know kind of creatively and alphabetically is is sort of where i find myself now um and uh yeah i look i look back on those movies quite quite a lot i mean another thing i suppose that had some influence on my more kind of genre uh tastes was i i i taped uh, the shining off the television it, at age nine I, I put in the vhs set the recording it was it was airing at like one or two a.m one night on british television so I, I set the recorder and a few days later you know i think my folks went out or they were in the yard or whatever and i, I snuck down and i watched it and broad daylight absolutely terrified me and i mean it's one of the great movies of all time anyway but it's also one of the scariest movies i think it's still the scariest movie i've ever watched and uh, yeah, so that that had quite an influence on me as well. So, so somewhere between those three, Kubrick, Kubrick, Jimmy Stewart, and Peter Sellers. <laughs> okay, I think that's a very uh, a very solid group you got there. Um, when you were first starting out and kind of picturing where your career path would take you, did you ever envision kind of falling into I don't know maybe a specific medium or a specific genre, or did you always know you wanted to do a little bit of everything? Yeah, I've I've always admired the kind of chameleonic actor. Really, um, you know, I, I get it. There are some people who they they have their thing and they show up, and it's like, oh, it's them. They're doing the thing. That's great. Um, I admire that, but I don't. I don't feel like that's that's me. That's my. That's what I've you know uh, been put here to do. You know, I like kind of slipping around and 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 falling into things, falling out of them. You know, really throwing myself into stuff and and being unrecognizable mainly to myself I think and, and just sort of escaping into roles and surprising myself and hopefully you know surprising some other people raising some smiles and eyebrows and you know you've accomplished that I can assure you that <laughs> uh moving into one of the obvious very big the very big uh, beginning credits for you is uh Downton of course so I'm Curious, I know you had some experience doing some other TV miniseries before, but production wise, what do you think was the biggest, I don't know, shock or challenge of jumping into a full series like that? It was a real challenge, just the sort of the number of people involved, I think, you know, with that show, you had 20 main characters, really, plus the house. And so, you know, it's a really interesting kind of jigsaw puzzle, putting that putting that thing together. Um, you know, it, it, it should be said that when we started that, job though it felt very much like any other british period drama that we were making i mean i don't think anybody would have said going into episode one of that um oh here comes this freak phenomenon that's gonna you know be the biggest watched tv show in spain ever or whatever you know there was some really sort of bizarre things that it, it, it became but when we started out you know it was you know, very much an upstairs, downstairs story set in another, you know, fancy English house and 2000 I think, when it was commissioned and it was a you know big economic downturn and we were just very grateful for the work, you know, and uh, we had no idea what it was going to become. So obviously it became one of the biggest smash hits of all time. So for you, especially going back to your mentality with wanting to do a whole bunch of things, when that show took off, did you find that you were getting a lot of offers? And did you find that they were, I don't know, maybe very similar to your character on Downton? 
There were a few kind of World War One trenches kind of scripts coming in, and uh, you know, particularly in England, there's a there's a you know there are a few narrow bands of things that get made over there um, in comparison to say in America, and uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, you're very very quickly put into that bracket of like, well, he does uh, you know posh house dramas and sort of World War One dramas, and you know anything with floppy hair, uh, and uh, I was like, okay, that's fine but I kind of want to do this and that is like no no no, you can't do that um and uh so I came to America <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is a really big deal when you hit that point in your career when you kind of gain the confidence to take you know the reins of your career in your own hands so can you kind of talk us through that mentality uh you know just in your mind knowing you had the confidence to do that but also with the team around you that's encouraging you to pursue a certain path yeah, I mean, a lot of it comes from, uh, you know, the support of my wife, who was, you know, we had two small children when we left the UK. And, and she said, look, this is, this is clearly what we should be doing. And, uh, you know, initially, I came to New York just to do a play. And then uh, got a role in a Scott Frank movie with Liam Neeson. And that just sort of, you know, things just grew from there. But there was never a big game plan. Everyone was like, you know, you know, what was the plan after you left Downton Abbey? There really wasn't one other than I want to do something else, you know? And so what that then becomes is, is a great combination of people being prepared to see you do something else and coming to you with roles and, you know, auditioning very often, like I did for Scott Frank and him saying, you know what, I've never seen you do something like this. I'd love to see you try. And that is literally all any actor wants to hear, needs to hear in order to further their career and, and, and find things in other areas. It, it, you know, it, it, very little other than that is just someone else's preparation to see you do something else. Um, because otherwise you will stay in the same thing. And, and also it's, it's saying no to some things. So, you know, you say no to those World War I trench dramas initially, you know, I'm sure I will do one again and I'll, it will be great. But, uh, you know, if, if I were to just keep saying yes to the same things, then I would stay in that, in that narrow band. So, you know, it's, it's looking for the right people, finding those, you know, those connects and, and um, you know, things, things grow from there. And I would say it's only very recently that I've, I've sort of been in a position to actually say, you know what, I want to do this now. It, it's, you know, half your life as an actor is spent just being like, well, what's anybody doing? You know, huh, they're making a movie about Eurovision. Great. I'll, I'd love to do that. You know, that wasn't my, that wasn't me sort of willing that into being. Um, but, uh, you know, so it, 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 it comes in stages, I think. Backtracking a little, was that play The Heiress? It was, yeah, yeah. I, I happen to have lived in the building attached to that theater, and I used to be in the, the gym with David, like, every oh, other night. <laughs> so I, I went and I saw it because I lived right next door, too, and I always prioritized <laughs> those two theaters. Yeah, yeah, the Walter Kerr, yeah. Yep. yeah great. What would you say, because I know you had a bunch of stage work before that, what would you say is the biggest difference between the productions you were a part of and what it was like doing your first Broadway production? Yeah, that was a pretty special moment. I mean, I think everybody's first time on Broadway is is amazing because it, it is such a community. And also, you know, you just you just become aware of the of the audience and the the sort of the the buzz off the audience of just being there, being a part of this giant theatrical community, this giant phenomenon in, in the middle of Manhattan. And, you know, we had people who, who said they'd driven 16, 17 hours to come and see our play, which, you know, it's just physically not possible to do that in the UK. And if someone does live 17 hours away from the West End of London, they're not going to come and see you at a play. So, you know, that was, that was really magical to sort of see people's hunger and appetite and, uh, you know, it's one of, it one of the most heartbreaking things about the current situation. I was I was actually back on Broadway uh, when this whole thing went down, and um, you know, just to see those theaters dark until probably twenty twenty one is 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 really heartbreaking. Have you guys spoken at all about how to kind of come back to it? Because I actually didn't even think about this until somebody else brought it up to me. Just how much more of a challenge you know, Broadway and theater is going to see, because at least on a film set, you can make a film with a smaller cast, a smaller company, but when you've got theater, like, you require all these piece, people, especially musical theater, plus the audience. Is there any yeah. kind of ideas swirling that you think could get people back to work quicker? I, it's it's very tricky to know how, how that's going to work. I mean, there have been some very uh, valiant attempts at, you know, some online readings, and I've done a couple of them, and they uh, they have sort of mixed success especially when my internet breaks down halfway through the second half you know that that's just something that you live with um 
I, I, it's yeah, it's very tricky. I mean, you know, it was it was exciting the other day to sort of premiere Dave Franco's movie at a drive-in. You know, unfortunately, there's not quite the same. Well, I don't know. Now I'm thinking. Now I'm thinking out loud. Drive-in theatre. Maybe that's the answer. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's very tricky. You know, there's there's always somebody coughing in a theatre audience, and uh, it's going to be a while before anyone wants to sit around that. It does seem like the drive-in experience could be a way to bring all forms of of content creation, whether it's you know whether it's a stage production, a drive-in movie, or even live comedy. Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard some very interesting ideas from from different people. Benjamin Milpiot at the LA Dance Project has been talking about some really innovative ideas, and I think drive-in, you know, a drive-in performance of some kind was uh, was mentioned and. So yeah, I mean, listen, anything is possible these days and nothing is without the realms of possibility. I would love to to be a part of something that was, uh, you know, breaking new ground, you know, creatively in that way. And that, that also, you know, being at that drive-in the other night, you know, a, a bit like the Broadway thing, it was, it was just great to see people's appetite to want to go and be a part of the collective cultural experience, you know. I mean, it's great being able to watch movies at home and people have great setups now and the sound is fantastic, but actually there's something about just like seeing people and just, you know, being in a different environment and, uh, you know, sitting on the hood of your car and, and watching a movie. It's actually my first time at a drive-in. So I was just thrilled, Oh wow. you know, period. I was thrilled, but, uh, but I can see, I can see why that, why that does appeal. And especially now we're over a hundred days of lockdown. I think, you know, people just want to want to get out there and, and see people in, in as safe and as practical a way as they can. Well, for folks who are stuck at home and don't have a drive-in nearby, they can just sit on Netflix and watch The Guest over and over. <laughs> that is also an experience. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am mildly obsessed with that movie, and I am curious, had you ever discussed with Simon and Adam who David really is? Because I've gotten kind of caught up in that theory that maybe he really is their son, and I love to think about that. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, no, I've I've heard various theories of, over the years that you know maybe he's a cyborg or yeah he's a he's a reconstruction of uh, of their son. Um, I don't I, I I wouldn't want to dispel any of those any of those theories right now. I know that we had our own about it, and it was um it was a really mischievous film to make, you know, for those reasons because there are so many unanswered questions going on, and yet you within. The, the, the framework of the film, you don't really have time to answer them. <laughs> so, you know, there's so much crazy stuff going on that you're just like, wait, what, you know, and, and uh, I, you know, I'm very, very fond of that movie and, and you know, the, the experience of making it, but then the experience of just people enjoying it for, for years since has been great. Oh yeah. I try not to be greedy with my favorite horror movies, but have you guys ever seriously talked about continuing his story with a sequel? It's been talked about as well. I don't know quite what form that would take. And obviously, uh, Adam's pretty busy with some uh, giant apes and monsters right now. Um, so so we'll see if he uh, if he turns his attention back to that. Um, but I, I know we've we've talked about it for sure. In a complete turnaround, stepping into a more wholesome realm right now, if you had the opportunity to play another classic Disney character in live action form, what character would you pick and why? Oh my goodness. Um, I mean, oh, that's a really, that's a really good question. I thought Jafar's parrot got a bit of a, a raw deal in the remake. I think he could, uh, he, he could have had a, a few better lines. <laughs> <laughs> I I could see you, uh, you making that character work, especially with your, your voice work recently. I feel like I'm, I'm jumping around a little here, but uh, like you're phenomenal in Kipo. <laughs> Oh, thanks. That's a lot oh. of fun, that one. Yeah. Um, does that experience make you want to lend your voice to more animated characters? Definitely. Yeah. That's something I've always, always had an eye on. And, you know, it takes a while to break into that world. I think, first of all, for people to know that you, it's something you want to do, um, but then for people to learn that you can do it as well. And, you know, voice work, whether it's live action or, you know, in, in audio, radio is something I've always loved and, you know, keying into a voice for a character. The great thing about something like Kipo is you can just go completely insane. And, you know, it was sort of, uh, it was an amalgam of a number of different things. Um, like Tom Hulse in Amadeus was a big uh, influence, you know, just a sort of mad Mozart kind of creation. Um, but also just, yeah, this sort of insane mandrel um, in such a cool world as well. I really, I'm very fond of that show. I think, you know, the, the world they created there um, was, was really awesome. And it's been great fun sitting and watching it with my kids. Oh my God, it's it's so fun sitting there and just watching you and also imagining what it might look like in that sound booth. 
It's pretty Jingle pretty mad. Day. It's yeah, it gets pretty sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of other, um, other, I guess, audio work or voice work, I'm endlessly fascinated by the audio book process, the narration process. Can you give me a little insight into how something like that actually comes to be? Does it take hours and hours to get it done? Are you switching from voice to voice as, as quickly as it sounds in my ear? Yeah, very often uh, I am. And again, it's something I love doing. Um, you know, I, 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 pride myself on, on taking a long time to prep those books very often and it can take you know sometimes twice as long to re to prep it as to record it just going through marking out who's saying what when and very often I will cast it in my in my head you know so I think oh okay that's you know that's like Bill Nye or someone you know and I'll sort of like mark it up and then I sort of switch into a, a, a vague approximation of Bill Nye's voice or, or somebody and uh, you know and so you know, I, I might have some recurring voices as well. So, you know, generally, if there's an elderly, benevolent character in a in a in a book, he'll be Welsh. Um, and uh, you know, it's just my affection for the Welsh people. Um, but uh, it's you know, it's a great meeting of like an audio producer thinking that your voice fits this author, but then you know, just getting to grips with the with the voice of that author and 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 getting into their their rhythms and their sense of humour. Um, and finding, you know, the nuances of those characters. It's a real, it's a real joy. And it's something that you don't really get to do in any other medium, you know, to, to get to play all different kind of races and sexes and different creatures, you know, I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot of things which, yeah, I, it would be wildly inappropriate for me to try and do in live action, but for audiobook, it's, it's okay, I think. <laughs> Just because I'm obsessed with Stephen King and you already brought up The Shining, I feel like we should get you a Stephen King book to narrate. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my absolute favorite out there. Uh, just in general, over the course of your career, what's one thing that you've done for either a film or a show that makes you think, I am so glad I did that then, but never again? Wow. Um, I'm so glad I did that, that. You mean in terms of like, whether if it's become unacceptable since or or just oh, sort of like uh, i wasn't uh, going down that path but okay. i guess that could come into play right now too falls into that category yet um but um i mean i, I don't know i mean I, I think you know something like the guest you know the the action sequences for that and the the sort of rigorous training i mean i'm that really set me up for a for a you know the next few years in terms of the physicality of roles and things and i i'm i am very glad that i i got that in then um, I also don't think I could suddenly just transform myself now, but I've, I've definitely got myself into a position where, you know, um, just physically, my physical engagement with roles since the guest has been totally different. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, the timing of when that came along and, and how that's influenced my work since is, was, was great. My prediction for uh, the answer to that question was going to be apostle because that just looks... Oh, E exhausting to me yeah that, that's what i mean i would work with gareth evans again in a heartbeat but i've said no more no more underground troughs full of uh, animal parts <laughs> i do not blame you um yeah. also just a general question you like to do a little bit of everything but is there a particular genre that's your favorite to play musical comedies have been uh have been right up there recently i think there's something so fun and and you know going back to what we were saying at the beginning things that things that inspired me as a kid, like watching Singing in the Rain or something, you know, actors who could do it all, who could, who could really tick all the boxes and, you know, make them laugh and dance off the walls and, you know, everything else. I, I just, I have huge admiration for, for projects that try and do that, actors who try and do that. And, uh, and it's just so rewarding when I get to work with, you know, singing coaches and choreographers and, you know, the, the full spectrum of, of the of the movie industry in one project is, is is so rewarding. And you definitely get to tap into that in Eurovision quite a bit to great effect. Yeah. What for you is the key to playing really big comedy like that, but also making Lemtov feel like, you know, a real human being with believable motivations? Yeah, I, you know, I think it, it is just that. It's finding finding a reality for him. And, you know, however absurd that might be, and, you know, I think initially it was really rooting him in that kind of, you know, mysteriously wealthy European kind of type that has this sort of particular prejudice, uh, you know, given how how massive his bank account is, you know, and, and just the way that he sees the world. And, you know, I've uh, in, in my life, I've met a few mysteriously wealthy European characters who just, you know, 
they just have weird kind of snobbery about things and and it's it doesn't even feel like snobbery for them it's just it's just how they see the world you know just things some things are great some things are not great and if it's covered in gold it's probably better you know and uh, and there are some people some of them are running countries uh, who who see the world in that way <laughs> um when you're working with Will as not just a co-star here, but also as a writer and producer, what are, what do you get out of his leadership on set? And because he's also a writer and producer on this, do you find that he is, uh, I don't know, maybe more willing to play on set and change things up and rewrite dialogue? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the only time I've, I've worked with Will and I was so excited to get the opportunity because I've been a fan of his for, for so long and I just love his particular brand of silliness and you know he, he's uh, he's been a huge figure in my sort of you know growing up with comedy really and um, yeah I, I don't know if, if being a producer makes him more playful I know that he is very playful he's very welcoming and you know he's just a really nice guy and that's not always the case with your comedic heroes you know when you when you meet them but uh, yeah, he's incredibly generous and very, very silly. And and also, you know, it was interesting talking to him about where his comedy comes from, that it's not from a, a particularly mean place. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, with Lars, for example, he's not playing Lars like he's a bad musician. You know, he's playing Lars like he's the greatest musician Iceland has ever produced and the world just hasn't realized this yet. And that is that ends up being funnier to me and and you know if you look at a lot of his roles really they all kind of think they're pretty great and you know that he's not he's not playing a bad news anchor man he's he's playing someone who thinks he's the greatest you know and and um you know all all of these characters he's he's created they have a they have a, a similar quality i think and um yeah so it was it was really you know with eurovision it was about that really having sort of uh, an affectionate take on the competition. I don't think we ever wanted to sort of do the competition down. It, it kind of does that for itself. It's a totally bizarre thing uh, that has, you know, plenty of weirdness going for it. We didn't need to ice that cake at all. So it was really about finding the characters within that, making them as real as, as we could within the bizarre world of Eurovision and, and just letting them play with each other. Is there any particular scene in the movie where you found it most challenging to gauge where to fall on the weirdness scale or, or just how big to go with something? <laughs> um, I don't know, really. I, I think, um, you know, looking back on the on the stage performance, you know, we, we knew that we had to go pretty big on that and the choreography and the costume and everything. Um, you know, looking back on it, I thought I was going pretty big and it is pretty big, but I still think I could have gone bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, I actually truly feel like I could have gotten a whole Lemtov movie or maybe just like revisit all of these events strictly from his perspective. Yeah, I think there's, there's maybe more fun to be had with him somewhere. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a great, it was a really fun character to, to inhabit. And, and also just to, you know, to, to get to play alongside Will in a character that, that, that had that kind of, you know that had his perspective you know that you could really it wasn't sort of imitating what will was doing in any way we mm -hmm. were just doing our own thing but it somehow i don't know it, it played very well together i think how about doing moments with both will and rachel do they approach the comedy in you know the same manner or do they have different styles that you then find yourself adapting to yeah i, I mean it was very much about you know coming into their world it's their it's their movie and uh you know rachel is is so sweet and so funny and has you know particularly as sigrid has this this beautiful kind of naivety and sweetness about her and and uh you know there's really not a bad bone in in sigrid's body you know and uh and so it's it's just kind of it's just really lovely to be around i think you know that that kind of energy and uh and Lemtov obviously sees something in Sigrid that he wants to he wants to protect and and liberate and um, and also you know sees that he can maybe use use it for his own his own ends as well. So um, you know it was an interesting an interesting dynamic. But they're very sweet together, Will and Rachel, and uh, you know a very very playful weird duo. <laughs> I can definitely sense that, and I think this movie needed it. The way the way you describe uh, Sigrid in this is exactly why I fell for the movie. It's just, you know, as much fun as I'm having with how big it goes, it's her pure passion for what she's doing that is essentially the heart of the entire thing. 
Yeah, totally. Yeah, she's the emotional heart. She's the sweetness. And, uh, you know, it's a ridiculous film. It's very silly. Eurovision is very silly. Um, you know, we're not, uh, we weren't looking to make uh, something sort of, you know, serious and intense about the Eurovision Song Contest. And I think, you know, people should be aware of that going into it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just a, a bit of joy and silliness and some, some really cool music and some kind of weird music as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I for one really needed that right now. I'm also a little obsessed with the song along scene because oh, yeah. that was that blew my mind. I thought it was fantastic. I have so many questions about it. Just how long did it take? Was the vibe on set as invigorating as the final product? Just tell me about walking through that. Yeah, it's a really it's a really epic sequence and it's completely bonkers and it kind of is is really a, a sort of hallmark of the of the movie really in terms of just how insane it can get. Um, you know, I think we had 12 uh, real life contestants, you know, from previous years, some of them winners, some of them, you know, very notable uh, performers. And um, I've shown that sequence to a few hardcore Eurovision fans who absolutely lost their minds when they saw it because it's just, it's very joyous, I think. I, I just can't help smiling when I watch it. It's just pure silliness. The arrangement of the music is brilliant. And the way that, you know, we go through that party and they just pop out and join in is just, it's just joy. And uh, yeah, I think if, you know, even if you don't know who those people are, um, it, it's, a, it's a fun sequence. And it was about three days of shooting up at Nebworth Castle in just outside London. And uh, it was a real, real party atmosphere. And, and those contestants were pretty thrilled, I think, that, you know, we, A, that we were doing a Eurovision movie, but, you know, that they got to be a part of it, that they got to sort of play and, and sing with us. They're, all of them are incredible singers and just mm -hmm. kind of keeping up with them was, was a challenge. But, um, yeah, it was great just, you know, talking to them about their Eurovision experiences. And they all, without question, said that it was one of the most bizarre nights of their life being performing at the real Eurovision. And, uh, and I think ours came close. <laughs> Just for you in general, whether it's Eurovision or another film or show or stage production, have you ever had that experience where you're just sitting and watching a movie that you made at a premiere for, for, for a very first time, for a very first screening, and you're just thinking like, I don't know, this, like this is bizarre. I can't believe I did that. Yeah, I mean, I, the guest would definitely be one of those. We premiered it at Midnight Madness at Sundance, yes. and I was so nervous. I actually hadn't seen it. They hadn't let me see it before then. Normally you get to see a cut, but I think they were you know, right up to the wire. And I had no idea how it was going to be received. And it was just the perfect place to, you know, to premiere it. And uh, the audience went, went nuts. And I was just so thrilled with it. It's such a cool, such a cool movie. And, uh, you know, the soundtrack was epic. And it was just overwhelming, so really, sitting in that audience. And I, I will never forget that. that. Yeah, that's a special one. And especially when you get to premiere something like that in the midnight program of a film festival lineup, especially South by Sundance, Fantastic Fest, you name it. Yeah. That's a special, it special my, place. My first time at a midnight uh, midnight screening at all. So it was just, you know, the whole the whole experience was just great. We need to get you another horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> you need to hit the horror circuit. I think you'll really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it's, the audience is a, a wild. And uh, yeah, I really, I love that. That whole scene is great. So let's move briefly to the rental. I have to wrap up with you soon. So maybe let's go with uh, what do you think it is about Dave Franco's style as a director that will make him stand out for years to come? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, it's an incredibly accomplished debut and, and he really, really knew what he wanted. And it was a surprising style. I think a lot of people expected him to come out of the gate with a comedy and you know, he's actually much more of a cinephile than I think people would give him credit for. He's really, you know, a real genre fan. And this was something he he really knew that he, you know, what he wanted to make and how specific and, uh, you know, um, how much control he had over what he wanted was was really incredible, you know, and, and quite surprising, I think. Um, not that I thought he wasn't going to be, but I, I just think, you know, the extent to which he was prepared and how he worked with Christian, the, the, the DP and, you know, it was just, uh, it was exactly what he, what he set out to make. And I think, you know, I always like that when, when a movie I see matches completely with the movie that was described to me in the, in the first meeting that I had, you know, that's a good journey, whether it's a good movie or not, that's for you guys to decide or whatever. But, you know, uh, for me as a, as a performer and somebody who engages in a project, if, if you're sitting there in a cafe and being like, okay, this is the movie I want to make. And then it ends up being that movie, then that's, that's great. 
That's awesome. Uh, before I let you go, just really quickly, a very big question to end on. I'm sure you have a lot of things that you've never done before that you're dying to do, but is there any particular itch that you want to scratch next? Like something you feel like you really need to do in order to keep moving forward? Oh God, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking now in terms of like genre mashups and things that haven't been done. Maybe the action musical. Maybe that's what we need. Maybe the guest too is a musical. I am 100% on board. Normally I'm very sensitive about things that I love being changed, but I am all for that change. I'm not sure that will happen, but you know, <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm thinking outside the box here. <laughs> One can hope. Dan, thank you so much for your time today. Again, a big congratulations on both movies. Thank for you. everyone out there, Eurovision, available to watch on Netflix. And then you can also check out The Rental when it's made available on July 24th. Dan, thank you again. Thanks to everybody out there watching. Do not leave this episode of Collider Connected without liking and sharing it. And we'll see you soon with more interviews. Thank you very much.